as you make your way back to your seats, hey, would you do me a favor? Would you give it up for our worship team? Man, they do such a great job leading us into the presence of God. Thank you guys for what you guys do. Love you guys. Hey, so I'm excited. We are going to, uh, we're going to be continuing on uh, in, our, in our series, How to Train an Elephant. We're on the second leg of our course of How to Train an Elephant. If you weren't with us last week, um, we spent some time learning about some of the basic the basic tips that an elephant trainer needs to learn and needs to know in order to be able to train the largest land mammal on the planet who has no natural predators to be able to train that animal to do circus tricks that kind of leave us going, how did they do that? And what we're learning as we go through this is that some of these same things that the, an elephant trainer uses to train this massive, powerful, huge animal are some of the same things that the enemy wants to do in our lives to convince us that we are stuck. We're talking about something that psychologists call learned helplessness, which is, which is the, a, a, a phrase that is used to define a situation when someone feels like they are incapable of enacting change or moving out of or escaping from a particular situation. And so we are continuing on uh, in this study. And what we're learning is that in the power of Christ and the power of the resurrection, we as followers of Jesus do not have to be stuck. And we are studying a, a man in the Bible by the name of David. And we're learning that even though he went through so many things that you and I likely have gone through in our life or will go through in our life, we find that he never really gets to the point where he is stuck, incapable of moving forward. And so today uh, we're going to or last week we spent some time specifically learning about um, the first lesson uh, that an elephant trainer needs to know, which is chain them when they're young. And what we learned was that an, a, an elephant trainer will take a, a baby elephant and chain them to a tree when they're young so that they lose the belief that they can escape. They begin to overlearn that they are not strong enough to overcome the chains that are holding them in place. And what we learned in our lives when we made the connection to us is that, that whatever it was that was said or done to you when you were small, when you were at your youngest and weakest, whatever it was that they said does not have to enslave you today. You, they don't have to keep you to a point of being stuck. And what we learned is that the whispers of the world cannot define what God has already declared about our lives. And I hope that last week you were blessed and encouraged. I, I'm praying that you will be this week as well, because this week we're going to dive into lesson two on the handbook of how to train an elephant. And this is the lesson that we're going to be discussing today. And it is this, make them forget, make them forget. I've learned some interesting things about elephants over the last several weeks um, as I've kind of done some research. For instance, did you know that elephants are widely renowned as being one of the most intelligent mammals on the planet? Some of you may, you know, have some family members that you know are not one of the more intelligent mammals on the planet. Maybe you're here today with somebody that we shouldn't raise hands. That, that's going to be dangerous. Uh, maybe you're here today and you're elbowing somebody, right? Um, but here's the deal. Elephants are one of the most intelligent mammals on the planet. Here's what we've learned about elephants, that elephants are one of four animals that scientists have discovered can recognize their face in a mirror. That's kind of what I thought. Wow, that's kind of cool. So then I started wondering, what are the other four? What are the other three? Right. So there's us. Congratulations. I hope that you recognize yourself when you look in the mirror. Uh, uh, number two is elephants. Number three are dolphins. Um, uh, Flipper gets a gets a nod. And then the last is the great ape. Now, I, don't, I didn't do any research on great apes. I don't know what's different between a great ape and a regular ape, but apparently there is a difference and they can recognize themselves. The other thing that's interesting about elephants is elephants have are known for having incredible memories. In fact, maybe you've heard the statement or the phrase before that that person has a has a memory like an elephant. Well, here's where it comes from. Elephants, their memories are so incredibly profound that they can remember important places. Now, if I'm being honest, when I first read that, I was like, OK, big deal. Why is that important? But if you lived in sub-Saharan Africa and there were droughts that were prone to happen, it might be important that you remember the important place where the watering hole was 
that you encountered several years ago or where you can find food in the midst of a drought. That'd be kind of important. The other thing that's interesting is that elephants, and this is maybe the most profound thing that I, that I found, um, is that there, there's a situation that's been observed that there were two elephants who were once in the circus together. And 23 years uh, after they were separated, they no longer did circus stuff, they brought these elephants back together. And after 23 years of being apart, they were able to tell that these two elephants remembered each other and recognized each other. Now, I don't know what's more amazing. The fact that those two elephants remembered each other after 23 years or two dudes were sitting back and going, you know what, Frank, I think they know each other. <laughs> I, don't what, I don't know what's more, more impressive. But here's the deal. Elephants have incredibly keen minds and they have remarkable memories. And any good elephant trainer knows this. And, and, it, and because they know this, then they're going to work really hard to try to make them forget some important things. For instance, one of the things that they're going to try to make them forget is what it felt like to be free. Part of the reason why elephant trainers will, will capture an elephant by the leg and, and chain them with their young is not just so that they come to the point of, 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 of believing that they can't escape, but they do it so that they will hopefully catch them and they will never remember what it was like to be free. And if they can, if they can start this process soon enough, then what they can actually do is not only replace the memory of what it was like to be free, but they can use an elephant's memory to their disadvantage because all an elephant will ever remember was the feeling of that chain around their leg. In fact, there's been, it's been noted before that, uh, that, that sometimes people would go around a, cir a circus uh, area and they would see elephants that would, that would be in a pen, in a cage that was rather flimsy in comparison to how big and strong an elephant is. And they would have a, a, a rope tied around them and the rope wouldn't even be attached to anything. And an elephant trainer will tell you that the reason for that is because all an elephant needs to feel is just a little bit of tug on that rope and it go, takes them back to their remarkable memory of all I know is what it feels like to be chained. And so as we spend some time this week, we need to spend some time understanding that our memories are an incredibly powerful thing. We make all kinds of decisions and and, and, and make moves and, and, and do all kinds of things based on our memory and our experience because our memory banks are full of all kinds of knowledge and experience and wisdom and expertise that help drive the decisions that we make today and the, and the things that we need to do in the future. But when we get to a point where we no longer have access to those necessary memories, well, then we can get to the point where we start to feel helpless. And in order to help us understand this a little bit more today, we're going to be looking again at our, at our man, David, and we're going to find him today that even though he is just a boy, too small to even put on a grown man's armor to go into battle, we're going to find that he has this incredible confidence to make this proclamation to a man who stands almost 10 foot tall. And this is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 45. It says, David speaks now to this giant. He says, you come to me with a sword, with a spear and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth and that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Wow. Wow. A boy talking like that to a giant. How did he get here? What's, what's the circumstance that caused this to happen? Where is the king and the armies of Israel? And why is David the one that's having this conversation with a giant? And perhaps most importantly, where does this, con where does this confidence come from? Well, we're going to learn all of that today. If you have your Bibles, open the book to 1 Samuel 17. It's where we're going to be spending our time. And as you do, I want to spend a little bit of time maybe setting the scene for us today. 
The events that we're going to read about today in 1 Samuel chapter 17 happen in an age that historians call the, 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 the overlap between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. To ma- there's three massive components of history, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and this is the intersection between the Bronze and the Iron Age. And what was customary in those days when two, when two armies would come together, they would sometimes do an all-out battle royale. Sometimes they, they kind of got smart and they started looking around like, you know what, I, we don't all need to die. And not all y'all need to die, because if we kill all y'all, then we don't have anybody to be our servants. So somebody at some point hatched up this great idea that, listen, how about we, find, we send our champion and you send your champion and y'all two just, you know, duke it out. Battle to the death and whoever wins, wins. The losing team will be your servants or do whatever it is that you ask of us. And the winning team gets to enjoy all of the spoils of victory. Seems like a pretty good idea. Well, in this age, in this scene, in this moment, we have the nation of Israel on on one hillside, one mountainside. And we have the nation of the Philistines on the other mountainside. And in between them is a valley. And in that valley stands a man of gigantic proportion. As we go through today, I'm going to share with you some things that are true about giants. And I'm going to share with you some things that we can learn from David when it comes to facing the giants in our lives. And the first thing that you and I probably don't, you don't need to be reminded about this, but one of the first things that we know about giants is that giants are huge. No duh. No duh. To illustrate it, though, I want to help you understand if you're unfamiliar with this story. Goliath was a man that stood nine feet, nine inches tall. It means that his head would barely clear the underside of a basketball rim. He was so big that it took 125 pounds of bronze just to have enough armor to cover his body. He was so strong that he had a javelin that the spearhead of his javelin was 17 pounds. Now I got to thinking about that this week. I was doing some cooking at home. I do that when it's necessary. And, and I, I was cooking in a cast iron skillet, right? Any of you guys use cast iron skillets? Yeah, the people who have some type of country roots, mostly. All y'all new fancy use that fandangled, you know, stuff, equipment, you know, non-stick frying pan. Listen, I grew up in Arkansas. We use cast iron. And so I was cooking on a cast iron skill and I picked that joker up and was like, you know, turning it over to pour the contents out onto a plate. Man, those dudes are stinking heavy. And I remember in a moment feeling super puny because I can remember my 95 year old grandmother before she died. I can remember my 95 year old grandmother still living at home, still cooking in her kitchen, flopping a cast iron skillet around like it was nothing. And here I am like, babe, can you help? Listen, a cast iron, you would need almost two cast iron skillets to be the spearhead of the end of Goliath's javelin. He's so strong, he can just pick that dude up and just manipulate it with one hand however he needs to. He's huge. He's big and he's strong. Here's the other thing that we need to understand about giants. Giants are defiant. Maybe because of their size, I'm not sure. But notice what it says in 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 8 through 10. And it said, then he stood, this is uh, Goliath, he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out, why have you not come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you the servants of Saul, Saul is the king of Israel. Choose a man for yourselves and let them come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Goliath is standing in the valley in between these two armies, and he is boldly and defiantly taunting and proclaiming, if you think you're big enough, then won't you put your big boy pants and come on down here and let's fight. The third thing that we need to understand about giants is that giants are persistent. This is what it says in verse 16. And the Philistine drew near and presented himself 40 
days, morning and evening. For 40 days this went on. Morning would come up. He would go into the valley. He would make his proclamation. Nobody would respond. He would go back up to his side. Evening came. He would come down into the valley, make his proclamation. Nobody came out again and again and again and again. For 40 days and 40 nights, Goliath persistently came and mocked and defied the armies of Israel. As we continue on in the story, we're going to introduce some new characters along the way. And at this point, I want to introduce King Saul and I want to introduce the nations of Israel. With this massive giant defiantly and persistently mocking them and their God, you would think that at some point somebody would do something to shut this dude up. I mean, if you were to think about it, if somebody were to walk in here and immediately start shouting obscenities about Jesus and about the church and and all that stuff, like I would hope at some point somebody would say, hey, man, like not the time, not the place. Glad to know nobody's got my back. (laughs) Really feeling the love. Fine, I'll step off and I'll say something. But I'm just going to be honest, if, 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 if old boy was 10 feet tall and was like Big John, the old song Big John, if you know that song, like if he was 10 foot tall, broad at the shoulder and narrow at the hip and Big John don't take no lip, I might say, hey, you know what? I've been thinking it's really not nice that you say those types of things. And that really hurts my feelings. Uh, maybe just maybe we can have this conversation outside. If homeboy walked in and he was like four feet tall, I would approach that very differently. You would think that somebody would stand up and do something, but that's not that's not what happens. What does Israel and their king do? Verses uh, 24 and 25 uh, verses 11. Sorry, uh, says this. When Saul and Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It continues in verse 24 and it says, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, Goliath, fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. Verse 25 goes on to say, So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from the taxes of Israel. Man, the entire nation, including the king, they are shaking in their boots. They are deathly afraid. King Saul, who is supposed to be the champion of Israel, because the Bible tells us that Saul was stood head and shoulders taller than every other man in Israel. King Saul should have been the one that was the champion. But what we learn here in verse 25 is it tells us that, that Saul started looking around and saw Goliath and goes, yeah, no. You know what? Here's what I've been thinking about this, boys. Here's what I'm going to do. Why should I get all the fun? Here's what I've been thinking. I tell you what, if whoever wants to go out here and whip that dude's tail, when you beat him, I will give you all kinds of riches. And I'll even give you my own daughter's hand in marriage. You will be a part of the royal family. Okay, I'll add a kicker. Uh, The kicker is, is no one in your house is going to ever have to pay taxes again. How many of you would like to never have to pay taxes again? Here's the deal. Nobody took him up on that offer. They were following his lead. He was scared to death. And so now so were they. And onto this scene enters our young hero. The nation of Israel is encamped on one side of a valley on the top of a hill. The nation of the Philistines is on another side on the top of a hill. There's a valley in between them. And Goliath has been there 40 days and 40 nights shouting his defiant proclamations against Israel and against their God. David is there because his dad said, hey, hey, boy, why don't you go take some food to your brothers? David's three oldest brothers are there on the front lines of battle, not really doing much battling, but they're there. And David shows up onto this scene, a young boy, enthusiastic, energetic, excited to go to the go to the front lines of battle. And once David gets there, 
We begin to learn some of the necessary things in order to see the giants of our lives defeated. The first thing that we need to note that David did is that David observed. David observed. First Samuel 17, verse 26 says this. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him. Right. So David's now shown up. He's got to the front lines now. He's got given all his food away. And he says, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Let me translate for you what just happened. David shows up and he hears and sees Goliath. And while everyone else is kind of freaking out and trembling and afraid, David shows up and goes, hey, boys, which one of y'all going to go down there and shut him up? I know y'all ain't just going to sit here and take that. I mean, that fool is down there defying the armies of the living God. Somebody, I am so, I showed up at the right time. I wish I had my popcorn because there's about to be a throwdown and that fool is going to lose. That's about how they responded. Notice his older brother. We enter, Eliab shows up on the scene now, which by the way, don't you love when you're reading a good book or you're watching a movie or a show or something like that? Don't you love watching the jealous sibling and that the insecurity that comes in the sibling rivalry? Like it's kind of funny to watch because it seems so petty. And that's exactly what's happening here. Verse 26, this is David's oldest brother, um, Eliab. And it says, then he spoke to them at, oh, I'm sorry. Verse 28, sorry, I got behind myself. Now Eliab, his oldest brother heard, when he spoke to the men and Eliab's anger was aroused against David. Here we go again. Little Davy boy showing up trying to upstage me. He, listen, he done, he done been announced king of, the, of Israel. Samuel done came and anointed his head with oil. I've about had it up to here with him. And now he's going to show up to the battle and start talking mess and acting like he's got all the answers. What's funny is, is you can hear the condescension in Eliab's voice when he says this. Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep uh, that you have in the wilderness? Can't you hear? He's saying, hey, listen, we're doing important stuff here. We are men of Israel. We are fighting the wars on, the ha on behalf of Israel, on behalf of the king and on behalf of an almighty God. We're doing important stuff here. Why are you here? And those puny little sheep that you're responsible for, who did you leave them with? I know your pride. In the insolence of your heart, for you have just come down just to see the battle. Here's what's ironic about this. What's ironic about this is something that I've learned in my life and maybe you'll learn in yours that that oftentimes people who were living by fear and not by faith. See people who were choosing to live by faith, willing to take big risks, to, to, to put things out for chance, to, to expect God to do something great in their life, to respond obediently, no matter what the call is, in faith and obedience to their God. And those who are living in fear don't understand that. It seems confusing. There, there will be uh, proclamations that you're just prideful or you're arrogant or, 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 or there's something wrong with you. But listen, I just got to tell you something this morning. Don't you ever let the voice of the fearful discourage you from being faithful. Because if God has called you to do something, it doesn't matter what it costs. It doesn't matter what the obstacle is. It doesn't matter what might come. If God has called you to it, he's going to see that he's going to get you through it. And I just got to tell you, I can't imagine being somebody who chooses to live every moment, every day, fearfully holding on to what they have in fear that they might lose it. No, 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 no. As followers of Jesus, you and I have to get to the point where we say, hey, you know what? I don't have anything anyway, because anything that I have is only because God has chosen, chosen to give it to me. You might say, well, yeah, but you've got a, a great job. Well, let me ask you the question. How did you get that job? Well, I knew somebody. OK, well, how did you know somebody? Well, I went to school with somebody. Well, how did you get there? Well, I did really good in school and got an education and da da da. Well, how did you get there? Here's the newsflash. You possess nothing that you got by yourself. 
Everything that you have and that I have is because God has chosen to allow us to possess it for a moment. And what God wants is not that we hold on in fear that we might lose what he has given us, but that we would respond with greater faith, understanding because he has entrusted it to us, that we would be willing at any moment, at any time, say, God, if you need it back, it's yours. And when we choose to live that way, everyone who's sitting over here in the camp of fear is not going to understand it. So don't you ever allow the voice of the fearful to discourage you from being faithful. What else do we learn as we follow the story? We learn this, that David committed David committed. Look what it says in verse 32. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. See, at this point, news has begun to spread about David. And he's like, man, what y'all doing? If y'all ain't going to do it, I'll do it. What's happening here? News is spread all the way up to King Saul. Saul sends for David. And David walks into the tent of King Saul. And I imagine Saul says, hey, boy, I hear you talking big. Somebody told me that you said that you thought you could beat that giant. And David responds in verse 32 and says, let no man's heart fail because of him. Y'all tripping. It's all good. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. It ain't nothing but a thing. Now, in this moment, it puts Saul in a difficult situation because in this moment, Saul has two problems. Number one, if he lets David go, then it says something profound because he is supposed to be the champion of Israel. And so if he lets David go, not only is he saying, hey, I am not your champion, but if David dies, Saul is going to have a terribly bad rap because that's the king who let the boy fight the giant and get killed. Here's the other problem Saul's got. If David goes down there and wins, well, that's going to be a problem because now everyone is going to start singing David's praises and not Saul's praises. So Saul's in a situation where he's darned if he does and he's darned if he doesn't. So in keeping with true Saul nature, if you've studied the life of Saul, if you know much about him, he has this incredible propensity to always do the stupid thing. Well, go on with you then. Good luck. Hey, why don't you take my battle, with, my battle armor with you? David tries to put the armor on, but it's so big, David can't even fit in. He goes, you know what? I'm good. I just go with this. I'll go with what I got. All right, then. Y'all help him. Here's what's interesting. Saul so asked David, what is it that makes you think that you can beat this giant, this champion of the Philistines? And perhaps the most significant thing for you and I to understand about what David did for us to connect to in our lives is David remembered. Notice what he says here in verse 34. It says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught that fool by its beard. I struck him down and I killed him. And your servant has killed both a lion and a bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine, which, by the way, to use the phrase uncircumcised in a sentence would be an incredibly derogatory term that would make it inappropriate for me to try to give you an equivalent in our English language in the house of the Lord today. But this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, which I love that it says moreover, it's like, and in addition to David said, the Lord will deliver me. If the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Here's what David's saying. He's saying, listen, I get it, King. I understand that we don't know each other super well. If you know the story of David and Saul, David has been spending some time with Saul playing music because Saul's kind of been going paranoid. I know that we've just met. I know you don't really know me very well. And I know I'm just a kid. 
But see, here's the thing that you, you need to understand about me is I realize that for you right now, this seems like I'm coming out of nowhere. It seems like I'm stepping into the spotlight, like I'm taking on this huge monster of a person and I've got all this confidence that I can beat him. But it's important that you understand that I don't come in my own confidence because you see, when I was back home, when nobody was looking, when nobody was around, when no one even cared who I was, you see what had happened was is my dad had told me to do something. And when I was in the midst of doing something, something came up that threatened the very thing that my dad told me to protect. And when that thing came up that my dad told me to protect it, one time it was a lion and that lion came up and you see, I had no other choice because I was told to take care of the sheep. And that means that sometimes I got to do things that are scary and it didn't feel super comfortable in the moment. But you know what happened? That lion came in and took one of my sheep. And I didn't just stand there and watch it happen. I went and chased after him. And when I chased after him, I realized that my God is with me to help me do something that feels really uncomfortable for me to do right now. And so I done went and I killed that lion. And you know what? I looked at that lion. I said, wow, my God is pretty big and my God is pretty awesome. Saul starts looking around and going, huh, that's kind of an interesting story. I ain't ever heard that before. He goes, oh, that's not even it. Let me tell you about the time that the bear came because that bear is big and its claws are tall, are big, and it stands up on its hind legs and it's intimidating. And I just got to tell you, here's what I learned when I took care of my sheep when that lion came, that when God tells me to do something, he is going to give me what I need to overcome it, any obstacle that might come along. And so when the lion came and I began to have faith that my God can help me overcome a lion, when when the bear came, I go, OK, if God did it, then maybe he'll do it again. And you know what happened? My God came through again. And so I just got to tell you something. When I was in the dark and nobody was paying attention to me, nobody knew who I was. Nobody even cared about me. You see, I've learned some things about me and my God. And when my God tells me to do it, all I need to do is say yes and watch him fight the battle for me. So when I come before you, I realize this seems like a big thing, but it ain't a big thing to me because I done killed the lion and I done killed the bear. And that uncircumcised Philistine who's defiling the armies of the Lord got nothing on me and my God. Hmm. You see, somebody needs to know today that maybe just maybe the thing that you're going through right now, maybe that's the thing that's going to give you the faith that you need to get to the real thing. Maybe some of you are facing some real things right now and you have forgotten about the time when God came through for you, when God provided for you, when he brought that person alongside of you, when he took care of that meal for you, the grocery bill for you. He brought you a car. He got you a scholarship in some kind of way. God took care of you. And I just want to tell you something. The same God who took care of you in that moment that seems small is the same God. If you are walking in obedience to him, will take care of you in the situation that seems large and so somebody just needs to know today that's a significant thing that the thing that gave David his confidence was that he remembered who his God was and he remembered that God had declared in his word over and over and over again about how he would protect Israel, how he would fight for Israel, how he would go to war on behalf of his people, Israel, how if Israel would just follow him, he would lead the way and he would take care of them and he would make their enemies their footstool. You see, that's what David remembered. And as David then goes on out to the battle, we see the last tactic of the enemy. And the last thing that you and I need to understand about giants is this, is that giants are intimidating. Notice what it says in verse 42. And when the Philistine looked, looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. You see, a lot of people would have heard something like that from a man like that, from a giant like that, and they would have been immediately crippled with fear. You see, that's what the rest of the army had done. That's what the rest of the nation Israel and their king had done. They were paralyzed by fear. 
But you see, David knew something and he had learned something along the way that the rest of the nation of Israel at some point had either not learned or had completely forgotten. And here's what David knew. David knew that, hey, that giant may be big, but my God is bigger. And that giant may be strong, but my God is stronger. And that giant right there, he may have something to say, but my God has the last word. And so what did David do? I love this. David declared. He said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you, homeboy, you have defiled that God. This day, the Lord is going to deliver you into my hand and I'm going to strike you. I'm going to take your head from you. And on this day, I will give your carcass to the camp of the Philistines and I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts and, uh, and all the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. I understand that they have forgotten about him, but I haven't. I haven't forgot about the God of Israel and I'm coming to you today in his name and I'm going to show you and watch this. I'm going to show them that there is a God in Israel, that he is still strong, that he is still active, that he is still fighting on our behalf. And I'm going to show everybody who that God is. And he finishes and he says that all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Woo. You got to love the confidence. Confidence that can't possibly come internally. It comes from above. And notice what David did. David attacked. Verse 48 says, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, that David hurried and ran toward the army of the Philistine. David comes barreling down that hillside, running straight through the valley. You can see little bitty David and big old massive Goliath. Boom, 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 boom. And notice what happens next. David prevailed. Verse 49 says, so then David put his hand into his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead. So the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. He was stunned. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and he struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. You know why? Because the entire nation of Israel, they were still living in the Bronze Age. There were only two swords in the entire nation of Israel. The nation of the Philistines were living in the Iron Age. They had iron. So what did David do? He didn't he didn't worry about it. Verse 40, 51 says, therefore, David ran, stood over the Philistine, took that big old sword, drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut his head off with it. You see, here's the thing that you and I need to understand today. That the giants in our lives are huge. They're defiant. They're persistent and they're intimidating. Just like Goliath was. But see, now onto the scene, I want to bring us into the equation. I want to bring us into the picture. Because a lot of us have probably heard this story before. A lot of us have sat here before like, yeah, all right, amen, right on. That's good stuff. That's a great story. One of my favorite stories, David, little bitty dude, Goliath, big dude. And David just straight kills him. I love it. It's one of my favorite stories. I get it. But what does that have to do with me today? You see, I think what happens is, is so oftentimes when we read this story, that you and I will cast ourselves in the role of David. And sometimes that can be really encouraging. If David did it, I can do it. If God was with David, God will be with me. But sometimes it's really discouraging because there's somebody that's here today that has been saying, man, I've been fighting this giant for a long, long time and I just never seem like I'm going to get victory over it. You hear a message like this and you hear about the goodness of God and the power of God and the greatness of God. And you're sitting there somewhere in your heart of hearts saying, yeah, I'm with you. I've heard it. I've tried it. But why do I still feel defeated? Why is this giant not going away? You see, for some of us, our our giant is an addiction. And you've gone to the 12 step program and you've gone to groups and you've done this and you've done that. 
but that giant is still defiant in your life. For some of us, our giant is debt. We've made some poor decisions and now we're left with this mountain, massive pile of debt. And it seems like we're never going to get unburied through it. Hey, can I tell you something? For some of us today, your giant is fear. For some of you, your giant is anxiety. For some of you, your giant is depression. And day after day, that giant rears its ugly head. You can't, you won't, you're too small, you're insignificant. Who are you? I'm too big. And just like the nation of Israel sat for 40 days and 40 nights and watched this giant of a man come out and defile them and defile the armies and defile the name of God by defiling them. Your giant continues to mock you and taunt you and cause you to ask the question, well, where is my God? If he still loves me, where is he? You've tried and you've tried and you've tried and you grit your teeth and and you've bore down and, and you've done everything that you can in your own power to kill this giant. But listen to me, I'm convinced that part of the problem is that we cast ourselves in this story into the role of David. Can I tell you something? This story was never written so that you and I would see ourselves as David. You see, the role that you and I play, we would be the nation of Israel who have cowered in fear to this huge, defiant, persistent, and intimidating giant that has been around for a long time. And you see, just like an elephant trainer will train that elephant, chain them when they're young to help them believe that they can't escape, but more importantly, make them forget what it felt like to be free in the first place. What happens with your giant is your giant will show up in your life and will convince you that you have always been this way. And will make you forget about the days that existed before the giant walked down the hillside and stood in the valley that is the mirror that you look at when you see yourself. The mirror that you look at when you look at your bank account, your situation or your circumstance. And the enemy will take this giant and make him so big and so large and so intimidating that all you can remember is what it felt like to be scared, to be afraid, to be concerned, to be intimidating, to feel like I'm never going to get out of this place. But sweet friends, it hasn't always been this way. There was a day when you were free. There was a day when you weren't anxious. There was a day when you weren't afraid. There was a day when you didn't wrestle with depression-like thoughts and suicidal tendencies. There was a day when debt did not reign over you so high that you couldn't see the sun. There was a day that you weren't addicted. I want to help you remember that day because the God who brought you into this life free from those things is the same God who stands here with us today declaring that you have not always been this way. This isn't how I created you. I want you to live in the freedom and the memory and the remembrance of the freedom and remembering how big I am and how strong I am and how good I am. Because I can help you overcome this giant, whatever it is. And see, here's what happens. When you and I begin to properly place ourselves into the story, not as David, but as Israel, then it allows this massive space to open up where we can finally begin to ask the question, if I'm not David, then who is? 
His name is Jesus. You see, Jesus is the one who 2,000 years ago stormed into the valley of humanity and said, I will defeat the largest giants that there are. He is our giant slayer. He's the one who defeated death. He's the one who defeated sin. He's the one who made it so that we don't have to be a slave to sin. He's the one who made it possible that we can remember what it was like to be free. And so here's what's amazing. When you and I now finally know our place in the story and allow Jesus to have the spotlight, allow Jesus to be our giant slayer, and in the name of Jesus, watch him declare that every giant must fall then we can respond as the nation of Israel did. Watch what na the nation of Israel did in verse 52. After David kills the giant, invigorated with new confidence and with new faith about what they had just seen, it says this, now the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted, I'm sure they did, because they said, hey, we don't have to be afraid anymore. That giant that has been huge and intimidating and defiant and persistent, where's he? Oh, God done took care of him. So they arose and they shouted and they pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley and to the gates of Ekron. Listen, here's what you and I need to understand when it comes to our life. You and I need to move out of the way. We need to allow Jesus to prove himself that he can be the giant slayer for whatever this giant is in your life. And when we allow that to happen, then we have a decision to make. We will either be paralyzed by fear or we will be propelled by faith. We can either be paralyzed in fear at the size and the strength and the audacity of the giant that stands in front of us, or we can be propelled by faith that our God is bigger and our God is stronger and our God has already freed us and delivered us from this giant. And when we begin to understand that, we begin to realize that I am not fighting my giant from a position of loss. I'm not fighting for victory, I fight from a position of victory. So here's what we need to learn today. We need to know how huge and defiant, and persistent, and intimidating our giants are. And even though we are not David in the story, there are things from David that we can learn when it comes to fighting our giants and learning how to let Jesus fight our battles for us. The first thing that we have to do is we have to observe. We've got to identify what is that giant? What is its name? Once we know its name and we can identify it, then we've got to commit to saying this giant in the name of Jesus, is not going to have victory over me. And I will not be stuck one more day. I will not be, be stuck in a position of learned helplessness one more day at the hand of that giant. And once we observe, once we commit, then we must remember that Jesus said, whom the Son has set free shall be free indeed. That I have not come to, to take life from you, but I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. We must remember that. And once we remember it, then we've got to declare in that God, in the name of that Savior, in the name of my God, this giant, not only should it fall, it must fall and it will fall. And then we attack. How do we attack? We do not attack with sword and spear. We do not attack through our, our self-will and our hard work. We attack in the name of Jesus through prayer and say, God, I need you. I can't do this anymore. God, I need you. And we attack through prayer, but we also attack through finding some community, finding some people that can stand behind us, stand with us and help us fight this battle. 
And when that happens, then I promise you, it may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may be next week or next month or next year. I don't know when it's going to happen. But I promise you in the name of Jesus, if you are walking and obediently pursuing Him, you will prevail. And that giant will fall. my great hope for you is that you would be able to look that giant in the face and the confidence of David saying you coming at me throwing my past my decisions my mistakes my failures my circumstances and my situation you can throw it all at me if you want but I stand because I belong to God I am a child of the king I am a son of God I am a daughter of God in the name of Jesus you won't win against me any longer so if you're here today and you've got a giant in your life listen I want to tell you that that giant can fall, it will fall, it must fall in the name of Jesus. But you've got to stop being David. And if you will, I promise you there is hope that will abound for you. That you will see victory you've never seen before in your life. And if you're here today and you don't belong to Christ, hey, can I just tell you, the hope of victory belongs to the one who overcame the grave and his name is Jesus and Jesus came not to die just for your sins to set you free from the hell that we're all destined to apart from him but to set you free from the hell that you're going through so I want to invite you today with your heads bowed and your eyes closed would today be the day that you would trust in Jesus, that you would let him be your savior, your Lord, that you would learn for the first time what it feels like and, and what it is to watch Jesus proclaim victory over areas that have only found defeat in your life. And if you do have that relationship with Jesus, maybe today's the day where you commit You've already observed, you know what your giant is, but maybe it's the day, today is the day where you commit to say, today, Jesus, in your name, this giant needs to fall. You see, there's some folks that are going to be on the side of the room. In just a second, we're going to stand and worship. Hey, listen, if you're facing a giant in your life, would you allow us to come around you and encourage you and pray for you? There is so much power in prayer. There's so much power in community. Would you let us be the church to you today to encourage you, to support you, to pray with you, to pray for you, that whatever the giant is in your life, that it will fall. In the name of Jesus, it must fall. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, we're going to stand and we're going to worship and we're going to sing because every single time the word of God is declared, it demands a response. What is the response that you need to make today? What is your next step today? We would love to help you and walk with you through it. You don't have to walk alone. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, every giant must fall. Thank you that in the name of Jesus, we no longer have to be stuck and paralyzed in fear, but that we can be propelled in faith in the God who sent his son to die on the cross for us to give us life and life abundantly. I pray for the person that's here today who's facing a giant that seems like they've been overwhelmed and overcome so many times. I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that they would see victory through you working on their behalf today. And I pray for the person today who doesn't know you, Jesus, that today would be the day that they would say yes to a new relationship with you. And God, as we remember who you are, as we proclaim your goodness and your greatness and your faithfulness, God, would you help us to experience the victory that you died to give us over our giants today? God, we will give you and you alone the glory because you are the one who fights our battles and you are the one who, who de declares our victory. And it's your name that we lift high in this place. We ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Would you stand and would you worship? Would you come let us minister to you?